G'day, welcome to this next video in the series on circulometry slash trigonometry. Now it's time to do some classic graphing of these trig functions. What's the graph of y equals sine of x? What's the graph of y equals cosine of x? And so on. But before I do that, let me see motivate why do I even want the graph of y equals sine of x? Why would one even care about this sort of thing? Well, it really comes from this. So in the universe, you can say there's, there's probably only really two fundamental types of motion going on. For example, we can see things moving in straight lines. So it's linear motion, and linear motion seems a very fundamental type of motion. And another fundamental type of motion would be circular motion, where things spin around. And of course, we get compound motions, like things spin as they move in a linear way, or there might be sort of, you know, gravitational force which can continually change motion. But you could argue that linear motion and circular motion are fundamental forms of motion worth thinking about that could actually help describe the universe very well. Now, linear motion is, is, is studied very well in the curriculum, you know, linear functions and all that. We understand straight line graphs, so that seems under belt. And the circular motion is exactly what we've been doing. It's actually about circulometry, the, the motion of the sun going on a circle, if you like. That blue piece of tape on my white ball is mimicking the exact thing we've been talking about all along the series. Great. Now, suppose you're an astronomer and you're, you're you know, seeing some planet going around a sun or some, know, some, circular, some circular motion going on in that galaxy. And if you're lucky enough to see it face on, you will recognize it as circular motion because you're seeing circular motion right now. But the chances of seeing circular motion face on is rare. You probably see it at a slight angle, in which case that motion is more elliptical. And in fact, you might even see it the worst case where you would see it just slide on completely. And all you can look at is that blue tape bobbing up and down. Its height is changing as it goes around the circular motion. But you don't see the circular motion, you just see a changing height bobbing up and down. And what is that bobbing height? Well, it's actually the height of that blue tape in circular motion. And what is the height of the sun as it goes around the circle? That's the sine function. We're actually seeing the sine function when you look at circular motion sideways. So this is why sine curves are often fundamental to describing the universe, because in some sense they often appear just seeing circular motion at the extreme case sideways. So let's plot the sine graph, let's plot the cosine graph, and maybe we can do a few more if we want to, and just get going with the mathematics. So let me do this. So let's graph y equals sine of x. And there's an equation and we want all the data values, all the x, y values that make that a true sentence in mathematics, in which case then we want to plot those points and get a graph of that particular curve. And we've done that, we've actually done that all that work, you know, sine of 30 degrees is, uh, oh I have to do it in my head, so 30 degrees is going to be, uh, there's going to be a half. There's a half, is that right? It's going to be half a side of an equilateral triangle. See, I've never memorized these things, I quickly drew that picture in my brain. So x is 30, y equals a half, there's a true data point. x equals 45, y equals 1 over root 2, that funny number, 0.707, is a true data point. Um, and so on and so on. So let's plot those data points. So let me do this. Let me just draw a sine graph over here. Um, this is very standard for a lot of people, but you know, when you're a student doing this for the first time, you've got to actually work your way through this and just plot those points by hand. And that's always a fun thing to do, and it's always worthwhile doing, once in your life, and you probably never want to do it again. All right, great. So. Um, sine of 30 degrees, we said was a half. So 30 is about there, about halfway up. So I'll, I'll make that one and that's a half, it's about there. Uh, sine of 45, we said about 0.707, one over root two, it's a bit higher. Um, well, major's not very good. Uh, sine of 90 degrees, when x is 90 and y is one, yep, that's true, bingo, height one. Uh, zero, sine of zero is zero, and off you go plotting points. In fact, on one of the very uh, second video I think it was, you actually get a whole data table of all the multiples of 30, or the multiples of 60, or the multiples of 45, or the multiples of 90 degrees, actually gives you enough data points to kind of see it's not a straight line graph, because actually 45 degrees is higher than halfway up, it's 0 0.7. 30 degrees is already halfway up, so it's bulging upwards. So maybe our graph is more like this, sort of a curve that bulges upwards like that. And then as the sun comes down and sets in the east, you go down to a height of zero. As the sun keeps going around, when it's directly below you at, uh, at 270 degrees, you're at height negative one, and so on. And then you get this graph, and when you're at 360 degrees, you're essentially back on the eastern horizon, so you just do it all again. And actually, if you go in the reverse direction, you can see you get a graph that looks like this. So there is a graph of y equals sine of x. Great, just literally plot the points and out pops that. Grand.
And of course you could also do a graph of y equals cosine of x. Uh, this is going to be plotting the overness of, this, of that point on circular motion, you know, the overness of the sun. Uh, so let me do that as well. Do, do, do. I'm cramming it in, not very good board technique here. 270 degrees, 180 degrees, 90 degrees, do, 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 do. negative 90, negative uh, 180, negative 270 degrees, negative 360 degrees. Of course you could do this in radians if you rather than doing degrees and probably in a pre-calculus class you, you, we might want students to do it in radians. Okay, radians, sure. Um, okay, cosine, cosine, y equals cosine of x. Um, when x is zero degrees, uh, what's my overness? Well, my sun is on the horizon, the eastern horizon is one over. It's at zero degrees, it's one. So when x is zero, y equals one, that makes a true data point. A true makes that a true sentence. One equals cosine of zero, true. There's that data point. At 90 degrees, when the sun is directly overhead, zero overness. 180 degrees, negative one overness. So actually you can do the same sort of work, check all the in-between values, and your students go through all the table values, da 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 da, and you get this sort of thing. Great! All right, my picture's a bit out of scale because my ones and negative ones are taller there than they are here, but they should be the same amplitude, should be the same height, and uh, this, everything repeats itself after 360, everything's repeating itself. But you can't notice something here, Help, can't not notice something right here. These graphs are basically the same. They, look at this. This cosine graph really just looks like a sine graph if I start at negative 90. In fact, Cosine really is sine, with x equals negative 90 behaving like zero. The sine graph starts there, goes zoom, zoom, zoom. The cosine graph has negative 90 doing exactly the same thing. So actually, looking at this picture, I can see this, that um, cosine being made to start, oh, sorry, sine, sine graph being made to start as though negative 90 is behaving like zero must be cosine. Whoa, whoa. Take the sine graph, but make it so that negative 90 is behaving like zero. So zero is behaving like zero over here, but now make it negative 90 behave like zero, and you've got the cosine graph. There's an interesting little trig identity. Wow. Uh, what's another one? I could look at this and say, oh no, let's go reverse. I could say this point here, if I look at the sine graph, it looks like it's just the cosine graph, but now with x equals 90 behaving like zero. So I take the cosine graph and make x equals 90 behave like zero for it, I will get the sine graph. So that's telling me, okay, take the cosine graph, make x equals 90 behave like zero, it's x equals 90. Do you see that's now making x equals 90 behave like zero? Put in 90, I get cosine of zero. That must give me the sine graph. Wow. So you get some really curious trig identities coming from this, and it kind of makes sense that there's some shift in 90 degrees should convert sine to cosine and vice versa, because after all, remember, cosine was just the sine of the complementary angle in that very early thinking, cosine the companion side length if you just turn the pictures 90 degrees. And there's the actual relationship twixt the two, right there. All right, so you probably read off other relations. For example, we did say at one point that cosine of negative x was the same as cosine of x. We notice it here, there's that lovely symmetry here. Sine of negative x was actually the opposite of sine of x, you can kind of see that anti-symmetry there. All those previous relations we talked about are manifest in the graphs as well. Probably worth noticing, talking about, all good. Grand, grand. Um, of course, people want to also graph things like uh, tangent of x and secant of x and all the rest, so let me just do one of those. Let me do, a, let me do an awkward one. Let's, let's graph y equals secant of x. Oh no, before I erase this one, I want one over cosine. Yeah, secant, secant. Y equals the secant of x. I suppose most people draw the graph of y equals tan next, tan of x next. But I'll do this one. It's the same principles involved. You have to think what you have to think your way through. But remember, this is one over cosine of x. So I've got to basically take the picture I luckily did not erase from the board, and somehow make the heights here, uh, heights of cosine. Now make them one over those heights. Ugh, ugh, ugh. It gives me the heebie-jeebie. Sorry. So this is just a puzzle. If I really want the answer. Type into Desmos, Wolf of Mouth or something. But I'm going to think of this as a puzzle. And it's got me nervous, so you see I'm being very human here. 90, 180, 270, 360, and I'm sure it's going to be essentially the same thing on the other side. Okay. All right, so think my way through. Think my way through. I've got all the cosine values, but now I want one over those. So at x equals zero, it has height one normally for cosine, but now I'll have height one over one. Oh, which is still one. Okay, still one. Still one at x equals zero. Um, x equals 90 degrees. 
When x is 90 degrees, cosine is 0, and I want to do 1 over cosine 90 degrees, 0. Not allowed. I can't divide by 0, so oh, that's a danger zone. Don't go there. This is curious. Uh, I can see that 270, cosine of 270 degrees is also 0. 1 over 0, oh, don't go there. Danger, danger zone. In fact, where else is 0? Negative 90 is danger. Negative 270, danger. So those, those lines, I'm crossing them out. Don't go, you cannot go there. 1 over 0, ain't going to happen. Ooh, so what's happening then? Now, now I'm going to think my way through. So how can, this is actually now puzzling. This is actually really intriguing. Um, let me just focus on this little bit here. So cosine goes from value 1 down to value 0. So it's all positive here. So I know 1 over positive number is always going to stay positive. And look, it's getting smaller, smaller, smaller. So as I get close to 90, I'm going to have 1 over a really small positive number. 1 over a really small positive number, say at 89.9 degrees. Well, 1 over a really small number is a really big positive number. So this graph must be wanting to be really big and positive. It must be going up and becoming really big and positive. So as I approach the danger zone, I can see 1 over really small positive numbers want to become big positive numbers. Oh, on the other side of 90, let's go to the other side of the danger zone. There I'm dealing with like 90.07 degrees would be a really small negative number. 1 over a really small negative number would be a really big negative number. Really big must be going down like this. Interesting, interesting. In fact, now I like playing with the danger zones. Look at 270. Uh, just to the left of 270, I've got really small negative numbers. Must be really large negative numbers, but I'll do one over them. Uh, on the other side, to the right of 270, I've got really small positive numbers. When one over the really small positive is a really big positive. Uh, negative 90. Uh, I can see I'm going to be really big and positive there, and I'm seeing, I'm being quicker now, really uh, small and negative there, inverted. Yep, big and negative. Uh, negative 270 uh, must be down like this, down like this. Whoa, playing with danger is kind of fun. Let's approach the danger zones. So what's going on here? Uh, at x equals 0, it's 1, and it goes up to really big positive numbers. It looks like it's basically doing the same thing over the other side. So it must be doing up to really big positive numbers like that. Ho, 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 coming together. Um, I guess that's it between negative 90 and 90, but I guess it's going to be kind of the same thing here between 90 and 270, but it's just like the negative version, the upside down version of all what I've just did. In fact, at x equals 180, I see a value negative 1. 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 1. So I must be having something like that. And I can sort of see that's right. As I go from 180 to 270, I'm getting smaller and smaller negative numbers for cosine, which means I'm getting bigger and bigger negative numbers for 1 over cosine. It fits. And in fact, I can start seeing now, here's the graph of secant. Y equals secant of x has this weird, strange, alternating U-shaped thingies. Cool, cool. All right, so I guess the homework should be, can you graph Y equals tan of x? And I think every, every student is made to do that in the, in the classes. But it's kind of fun when you think about this, we had puzzle puzzle way through this stuff. All right, so there's going to be a second uh, video on graphing trig functions about how to fit them to data. And let's do that next.